Hi there, welcome to the new video. Today we'll be talking about this paper, Unit Test Case Generation with Transformers. This is from researchers from Microsoft. So at very high level, the paper introduces the approach for generating unit test cases for Java programs using the Transformers model. So they specifically use BART model for this purpose, which is again a sequence to sequence model. We'll see into detail to how do they use that. But yeah, two major contributions that they make in this paper is to try out if any sequence sequence model such as BART can be tuned to generate test cases given a function. Whereas they also open source the largest available supervised parallel corpus for unit test case methods. So talking about unit test, unit test is a way of testing the unit or the smallest piece of code that can be logically isolated from the entire system or the repository that you have. So where you focus on writing the test such that you just test a particular functionality to if it's behaving to how it is expected to be or not. So these functions that you usually test are called focal methods. So without further ado, let's start with abstract. So in this paper, we propose Athena test. So this is what they're naming their work. It's an approach that aims at generating unit test cases by learning from real world developer written test cases. So they use sequence sequence transform model for a given method, which they call as focal method. So yeah, this being the first contribution, the second one being open sourcing the largest data set, which is methods to test, which comprise of 630,000 test cases from 70,000 open source repository from GitHub for the Java programming language. Okay. So once the test cases are generated, they evaluate those generation on certain properties to how test cases should be written, which includes the syntactic correctness, the number of test cases that the system generates and different ways of testing that API. They also collect the test coverage information, which basically calculates if all the functionality of the focal methods are being used or not. And after performing this automated evaluation, they do a user survey from professional developers in terms of how readable, understandable, and effective were the generated test cases. So yeah, with this background, let's move forward and read the exact method. So here authors first discuss the data collection method, which is methods to test. So they select 70,000 sample of public GitHub repository that are based on Java language that have at least 10 stars and have been updated in last five years and are original repositories, not forward ones. So this is the first level of filter that they apply to make sure the repository that they're dealing with is legit and active. So once you have the collection of all these 70,000 samples, they come up with certain heuristic. Then heuristics are based on best practices to how people usually define test cases in JUnit, which is one of the tools for writing unit test cases in Java. So one of which is like, there should be a particular folder structure where you'll find test cases written and the corresponding focal methods. So they write those parsers to kind of identify these relevant segments from the GitHub paths. So all of these things that they apply, like such as each test case would have add the rate test annotation before you start writing the test. So with all of these markers and heuristics to how people usually should write test cases in JUnit if they follow the best practices. So once you have done all of this, they're left with these many test cases pairs of which they split the training set of 80% validation of this and testing of 10%. So yeah, that was about how do they generate the training data. So if you see this pipeline, so you have your GitHub repositories, which is let's say 70,000 repositories with those filters of certain number of stars should be updated in the last five years and so on and so forth. You apply the heuristic to get the mapping of focal methods and the test cases. So that way you get two files and which are mapped one on one. Then you already have a BART transformers, which is a sequence to sequence model, which has encoder and decoder that was pre-trained on sentences at the level of denoising them. So we'll see to how the BART was trained in some time. So once you have that pre-trained BART, you do one more level of pre-training, which is code pre-training. So the one that I just mentioned, which was about denoising objective is this English level pre-training. Then you also have a code level pre-training where you show the model code snippets with some self-supervised objective. So once this pre-training stage is done, you go to the fine tuning stage where you input these test cases and focal methods to the encoder decoder setting and generate the relevant output. So yeah, that's the entire pipeline to how things are working. So we have already seen till here where we have got test cases and focal methods. Now let's move on and see the experiments around BART transformer. So talking about a background to how BART transformers work, it's a denoising auto encoder that utilizes sequence sequence transformer architecture. So as we mentioned, it's a denoising auto encoder, which means we have set of function that kind of transforms a given input into a noisy input. And at the output end, the model is supposed to denoise that 
and generate the correct output. So the transformation functions could be like masking a token, deleting a token, or maybe adding any token in between, or shuffling tokens to rearrange the sentence. So all of these things kind of applied, and we generate the input-output samples. And at the output end, model is trained against the cross entropy loss, in which it has to maximize the likelihood of the original input sequence. So the architecture would go something like this. Let's call encoder an E and decoder a D. Let's say you have an input I that you feed to a layer. Let's call it as transformation layer that has some inbuilt properties. As in, it could do a token masking, it could do token deletion, it could do sentence permutation, document rotation, or sentence infilling. So all of these can be applied randomly with certain probabilities. And once you get the output from this layer, you feed it to the encoder layer. So the encoder tries to encode all of these things in a thought vector, which gets feed to the decoder end. So decoder is autoregressive in nature, which means for any given input, you would try to generate the output that comes next to this word. And then this word gets as input to the next token. You generate the subsequent token and this chain goes on till the end of the text is reached. So this sequence that you generate is supposed to be I, which is pre-transformation stage input. So that way you feed in your encoder, the transformed version of the input and you train it against the original input format. So yeah, that's the idea for BART. So this paragraph basically tells about the model architecture, like it has 12 decoder layers, 12 encoder layers. These are the parameters. These are the warm up rate and so on and so forth. So now talking about the pre-training stages. So we have already seen the English pre-training stage. So apart from this model was also pre-trained on code snippets. Okay. Under which they again crawl the source code for Java repositories with certain number of filters. And once you have those code snippets, the similar pre-training strategies apply to what you did in English, where you delete 20% of the words and rotate half of the documents as a permutation. And all of this training is done for 10 epochs. So the intuition behind two pre-training stages is that with English pre-training, model would have learned the semantic and statistical properties to how natural language or to be more specific how english language is usually written so doing english pre-training stage at the early level and then having a subsequent code pre-training stage would have helped the model to gradually increase its knowledge from knowing what a general english would mean to how usually codes are written so this transition from being a generalist to a specialist would have helped the model in learning better parameters for the desired task so now talking about the fine tuning stage. So they map every test case as this format. So we are trying to learn this mapping, which is nothing but the conditional probability of generating the test case, having seen the focal method for which we want to generate that. So since all of this is being applied in a sequence to sequence architecture, you can think of this to be happening as a translation task, where you have a certain input language and you want to translate that to output language. So they use cross entropy loss at every time step T and eventually they do the summation of this loss across every time step at the decoder end and then back propagate the aggregated one. And since input and output both are about coding languages around Java, they use shared vocabulary embeddings for both encoder and decoder. So that the model doesn't need to relearn the embedding for the same word at both encoder and decoder end separately. Okay, so now talking about the model variants with which they try out all the experiments. So they try out all the possible permutation to see which version of the BART performs better. So the first one is BART scratch, where they do not pre-train BART at all. They just fine tune on this test case and focal method task. The second is BART English, where the model was pre-trained on English corpus from Wikipedia. And then it was fine tuned for this task of test case generation. The third one is BART code, where model was just pre-trained on the code snippets with the same logic to how English was pre-trained. And then it was again fine-tuned on the test case generation task. So both of these have one level of pre-training. Then the last method that they try out was BART English plus code, where the model was first pre-trained on English and then on the code snippets. And then it was fine-tuned on the test generation task. So if you see this table, we can clearly see as the training step increases, the validation loss is minimum for this blue line. So for English plus code snippet, if you pre-train your model and then do the fine-tuning on your downstream task, they saw model to be learning really better compared to other methods that they tried out. So among all of these, if you do not pre-train BERT with any of the data set, whether be it English or code, which is this red line, you can see a clear gap in the validation loss. So yeah, that's more or less expected and the intuition that we've already seen holds on to it. 
So now talking about the evaluation and experimental design. So the first question that they ask is that can our models learn to generate unit test cases, which is about this validation loss kind of tells like if you do a pre training with more general followed by a specialized data set, the validation loss seems to be decreasing really fast. So apart from that, they also calculate the blue score, which is nothing but the overlap matrix between what you generate and what is there. So they find the same correlated score like BART English plus Java is having high blue score compared to the rest of the models. They also talk about one more graph, which is about top K accuracy results. So as you increase the value of K, the number of perfect predictions also increase from bird scratch to bird Java plus English, which is negatively correlated to the validation loss because here the model tells about the confidence of generating relevant predictions as you increase the generated sample size. So summary for this research question is like pre-training on both English and source code showed a significant positive effect and model was able to get the best validation loss, blue score as well as the top K accuracy. So the second question that they ask, what is the quality of the generated test cases? So they test the syntactic correctness first. They found that the model was able to generate syntactically correct Java methods for 84% of the times. And on further manual investigation on these results, they found that the test cases that were long enough and since they were doing a clamping of let's say generating 1000 words or maybe 100 words, model was explicitly truncating those sequences to meet that upper limit demand because of which they saw an abrupt ending in the generated sequence. So what they do is they delete the last truncated statement and add a closing parenthesis over there. So for example, if you write something like this, if you have a full stop or let's say semicolon, and again, you start writing something from here and this is not the end. There is supposed to be something followed by this, but let's say this is the maximum length that you have already reached. So they truncate this thing and put a parenthesis over there. So this way they kind of complete the test case that the model has generated and avoid any dangling generations. So with this simple approach, they found the syntactic correctness reached 95%. So which clearly means the method was able to generate syntactically correct Java methods for most of the cases. Okay. Then the second is testing APIs. So as we saw, right, when they were generating this methods to test data set, they had set a couple of rules based on the coding standards to how people usually write test cases in JUnit. So they found like while testing the APIs, people usually like add the test annotation before the method name. So they tested on that functionality and they found like 99.99% of the cases model has correctly replicated this behavior. And 94.9% .9 of the times they found like the test cases were about testing the correct focal method, which was supposed to be tested. So which kind of says like model was not generating much of a false information. It was just happening for 6% of the times. So the summary for research question two comes out to be the approach generated syntactically correct test cases that conform to the unit test case standards from JUnit essentially because that was the initial level of filtering that they applied. Also model was able to generate test cases for testing variety of testing APIs. So the third question that they tackle was how does our approach compare to EvoSuite and GPT-3? So on which they found out by comparing the test coverage results. So for these focal methods, these are the number of lines that EvoSuite generates and these are the number of conditions that it tests for these focal methods. So if you compare this with Athena test, you can see the number of lines that Athena test generates is relatively higher, which means it would have generated or tested on more conditions, which can also be seen over here. For EvoSuite, it was 29. For Athena test, it's 41. So yeah. So talking about the summary for this question, they found that their approach generates test cases that accurately test the focal method and obtain comparable results with respect to EvoSuite, whereas it outperforms GPT-3. So because GPT-3 was not explicitly trained on this task, they had used the pre-trained model only. This could be possible reasons to why GPT-3 didn't perform well enough. So the final research question that they ask is do developers prefer Athena test cases over EvoSuite? So they did a survey with 12 Microsoft developers and the first question that they asked was which test case is more readable and understandable. So it can clearly be seen like the blue bars that you see, right, have relatively higher numbers compared to the red and green, which means developers preferred Athena test for this question. The second question that they asked was which test case is testing the method more appropriately. Again, the answer was Athena test. It could be simply because of the fact as we saw, like it's generating more test cases and the condition statements. 
The third and the final question that they were asked was which test case would you prefer to have in your project? Surprisingly, nobody said GPT-3. Some of them were inclined to EvoSuite, but most of the numbers were inclined to Athena test. So yeah, that says some strong results to Athena test or EvoSuite, I believe. So the summary for this Q4 was developers prefer the test cases generated by Athena test over EvoSuite in terms of readability, understandability, and even test effectiveness. So yeah, that's it, I guess, for the paper. Now they have related work discussions. So I would say it was a pretty interesting read. And the fact that they have open sourced their dataset is also commendable. And it's also good to see like the authors have covered thoroughly the experimentation and the evaluation cycle as well. So kudos on that. So having said that, if you like such content, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also share it across with your friends to whosoever is interested in such content. I'll meet you in the next one. Bye.